All right. Last Wednesday, we talked about um, the moral criticisms that people have against the Bible. We talked about the issue of uh, genocide that people often point to in the Bible. We talked about slavery. We talked about the status of women. And I mentioned last week that there's actually a fourth topic, and I want to actually spend the entire time tonight on this fourth topic. Um, and it's the question of, is the Bible homophobic? That is a topic that if I was doing this study 30 years ago, would not have even been brought up in a discussion of this sort. But there has been a massive change in our culture, uh, in the world around us, that this issue is one that we have to address, and to address it in a way that is not just a quick, simple, uh, condemning answer, but is a biblically informed answer uh, that will allow us to engage the culture with the truth of the gospel. And that's what I want us to look at tonight. So to give us a little context before we answer this question, I want us to just look first at the fact that there has been a change. Uh, society has changed on this issue. Uh, in 1973, just to give you some historical context, the American Psychiatric Association uh, removed homosexuality from its diagnostic manual um, as a mental disorder. Up until that point, it was listed as a mental disorder in the American Psychiatric Association's diagnostic manual, the DSM. Uh, it was listed as a mental disorder. So in 1973, it was removed. And that's just a historical date to kind of give you some context. In 1988, a study, a opinion poll was done uh, uh, in the United States asking the question if um, same-sex marriage unions, um, you know, those kind of legal recognition of relationships should be permitted. In 1988, 11% of Americans believed that that should be permitted. 30 years later, 2018, 68% of Americans believed that same-sex couples should be allowed to legally wed. That is a massive and rapid change in societal opinions. Um, unlike any other social issue in history, the rapidity of which it has um, changed is a, a phenomenal in terms of just looking at it from a societal perspective. Just to give you some, um, some, some context about the legal status, of um, homosexuality and same-sex relationships and the like. In 1996, Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA. Uh, this was passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly supported it. Bill Clinton was the president in 1996 and signed the Defense of Marriage Act because in 1996 the overwhelming majority of Americans supported the traditional definition of marriage as one man and one woman. In 2003, Supreme Court case Lawrence v. Texas struck down the remaining state laws that made they, they were called sodomy laws, but it was basically laws that prohibited homosexual behavior between consenting adults. In 2003, the Supreme Court struck those laws, those few remaining laws, down. There had been a longer period where you know, states individually had removed those laws, but in 2003 was when it was nationally uh, struck down. Up until that time in certain states, um, if you were known to be an openly practicing homosexual, it was a crime. Uh, in a lot of states. So, 2003. Uh, 2004, Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. Um, in 2004 was also a presidential election year, and uh, I'm sure many of you remember that <coughs> election, uh, John Kerry versus George W. Bush. And Karl Rove, who was one of Bush's main advisors, um, part, of his, part of Bush's re-election strategy was to put on the ballot in battleground states like Ohio and other places constitutional amendments defining marriage as between one man and one woman to rally social conservatives to go out and vote and then by consequence uh, vote, the hope was vote uh, for Bush. 
After the election, when Bush won re-election, Karl Rove said <coughs> that this issue would create a perpetual majority for social conservatives. That's 2004. Okay? In 2015, how many years is that? 11. 2015, June 26, 2015 to be exact, Supreme Court handed down its decision in Obergefell v. Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage in the United States. 2013, there was a case, U.S. v. Windsor, in which parts of the Defense of Marriage Act were ruled unconstitutional, um, but 2015 was the, 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 the landmark, across-the-board, sweeping um, Supreme Court decision. I tell you that just so that you can see a massive shift in society. This is why this issue has to be addressed. It's not because we Christians have made this our battle cry. It's because the culture is talking about this issue, and we need to be informed on what the Bible says about this particular issue so that we can address it in a way that is truthful and loving and hopefully lead people to Christ, um, not be condemning and you know, hate-filled and all that that sometimes can, be, can, can happen. So what caused the change in society? You'll find a lot of different people giving different perspectives. I would argue there's three main reasons that the views of society changed on this issue. I think the first one was probably the most dramatic and most important for people, and that is personal experience. Somebody would know someone who was a homosexual. Somebody would know somebody. They would have a child, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, somebody they knew, somebody they loved that had embraced this identity and lifestyle. And so when you know somebody, you know, it's easy to talk about something in the abstract. It's really hard to talk about something in the concrete. Uh, it's really hard to talk about something when we know people that it affects on a personal basis. Um, I, I remember one of, one of the first like major counseling sessions I had as a pastor was a, a woman came to me and her son had, had come out to her and said that he, he was gay. And she was just very distraught about that. And, and I tried to walk her through, you know, what's her responsibility as a parent to love her child and how love does not mean that you condone everything that a child does, because we, we know that instinctually. You don't condone everything somebody does, even though you love them completely. It was just so dramatic, because in time, her views completely changed. From being somebody who was dead set against this, to being somebody that because of her son, and what he was doing with his life, um, completely altered her view. That personal experience is so powerful for people. So I, I think that's part of it. I think secondly, there's an increasing desensitization in the media. Try to get that word out. In other words, the more you see something, uh, the more you're used to it, and the more likely you are to, um, to not find a problem with it. And the media is very powerful in that respect. Uh, the media really is the message. And so what we see in television and movies and just you know, normal everyday uh, interactions in the media um, influence what we consider normal. Um, and, and this isn't in a lot of areas, not just on this issue. I mean, just think about language, for instance. Uh, did anybody know when the very first use of profanity in a motion picture was? Bell with the Wind. Bell with the Wind in 1939. Frankly, my dear. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a hoot. <laughs> It would have worked just fine for Red Butler to say that, right? Um, but that was the very first time that profanity was used in a major motion picture. Could you imagine now? I mean, just just go just go to a PG thirteen, not an R rated movie, a PG thirteen rated movie sometime, and count the use of profanity. We don't even notice it. We've gotten desensitized to it. We, we're just so used to it, it doesn't affect us like it once did. Now, that didn't mean people didn't use profanity in 1939. It just wasn't something that was as common. So that desensitization is a... Yeah. 
speaking in tongues and not apparently, that desensitization happens. And then there's just normalization within a larger culture. What I mean by that is, um, one of the things, and it kind of goes with the media aspects to a degree too, and one of the things I remember in the 90s in particular in television is, is, is they had a, had a gay character or somebody, somebody would have a problem with it and, and they would say, well, not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, they, they would kind of throw that comment in there, and what that does is that normalizes certain behaviors and certain things, and, and we begin to, to just shift our attitudes on those behaviors. I think that's why, um, for a large part, this change has happened. And then there's the fourth, if you want to throw a fourth one in there, sometimes when things are legal, people don't see it as a problem anymore. Um, you know, if things are legalized, people don't see it as wrong. So there's something to be said for the, the illegalization of certain things for people to think that they're wrong. Um, you know, as marijuana is legalized, people don't see it as wrong. You know, 30 years ago, probably 90% of the population would have said that that was wrong and should be illegal. Now it's barely half. So it just that happens uh, with things. So what is the Bible? That's what we're here to do. But what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say about this topic? Well, more, uh, the Bible says more about it than some people would like, but not nearly as much as other people would like. Okay? Uh, that's where the problem is. That's the rub. Is that the Bible doesn't say as much on this issue as some people would like for it to, but it says some things, and so we have to deal with what it says. There are six primary passages in the Bible that people point to about homosexuality. Six primary, really seven, uh, but one of them is kind of a parallel passage, so people will say six. Six primary passages. That's not a lot, but it's something. So you can't just ignore it. You can't just sweep it under the rug and say it's not there. So there's six <coughs> passages. Um, I've given you most of them, but um, Genesis 19 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Um, just to kind of recap the story, uh, God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Lot's there. Abraham and God kind of argue back and forth and negotiate over Sodom. The angels go to Sodom to get Lot and his family and the residents of Sodom come to Lot's house and say, who are these strangers that are with you? We want to know them. And that's no in a biblical sense. Okay, So... So, so that's what's going on there. Now, some people will argue that that's not why God destroyed the city, but I think and hopefully we'll see that the actions of the residents of Sodom are symptomatic of a larger issue, which is their total disobedience and disregard of God. So that the, their, their homosexual behavior, regardless of what that looked like, was a fruit of the bigger problem. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean that God's not destroying them because of, of other things too, but that's what's going on in that story. <clears throat> Judges 19 is another um, example. It's a parallel type story. just happens in a different um, scenario. Uh, I would argue as a pastor that J Judges 19, 20, and 21 are probably three passages of the Bible I don't know if I can actually ever prove. They are just that graphically wicked. So go home, read it for yourself if you're interested. It shows the depravity of the human heart when God is not in the picture. Okay? Uh, Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13 basically say the same thing. So you have two passages there in Leviticus uh, saying that you know it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man as he would with a woman. Okay? Um, so those are the Leviticus passages. We'll deal with some of that here as we go forward. Romans 1, I'm not going to read all of this, but Paul is, is framing an argument where he basically says that the knowledge of God is there. People deny that knowledge. God gives them over to the depravity of their own hearts and their own minds, and sin is a result of that, and idolatry is a result of that. And unnatural human relations um, is a result of that. So that's that's what Paul's getting at there in um, Romans 1. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 um, says, and I'll read this one to you, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
due to sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greed, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. So this is a listing of, of sins. Not one sin is being pointed out, but a whole listing of sins, and that is listed in amongst those. And then 1 Timothy 1, 8-11, similar type um, structure, just a listing of sins, where it talks about um, this, this list of sins, and so it talks about you know, the ungodly, the unholy, those who strike their fathers and mothers, murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice on sexual enslavers, liars, perjurers, so on and so forth. So these are the biblical passages. So if you have a discussion with someone about what does the Bible say about homosexuality, this is where most of the time they go. I think that's the wrong approach. I think that is a pointless argument to have with somebody. Because here's what somebody, here's the problem with, with the approach that many times people take. It's kind of like the difference between a six shooter and a machine gun. Okay? If I've got a six shooter revolver, I'm going to get how many shots? Six. Okay? If I've got a machine gun, I'm going to get a whole lot more, right? Here's how a lot of people look at it. They kind of say, well, let's balance out the Bible passages, shall we? You know, we've got this six passages over here. We've got all these other passages over here that say what I think it ought to say on certain things. My passages outweigh your passages, therefore I win. That's how some people approach this. Like, if you've got enough Bible verses on your side, you win the argument. That's not really the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is not a book that we pull verses from to argue over things. That's not how this works. So, so how do we approach this issue? What I want us to look at tonight, I think, is probably the reason why in, a, in our culture we Christians have lost this battle. Because we have taken the approach of, here's our six Bible verses that support our position, and we ignore everything else that the Bible says. I think you'd have a whole Bible view that takes the entirety of the Scriptures to present, what does God say? These six verses are part of that. But it's not, here's my Bible verses against your Bible verses. So how do we approach this issue? I think the key thing we have to do as Christians is point to God's higher standard for all relationships. Do you know when evangelical Christians lost the battle over sexual morality in this culture? It wasn't in 2015 when the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. It wasn't in 2004 when Massachusetts legalized it. It wasn't when the Supreme Court overturned Sodom law. We lost the battle in the 1960s. Here's when we lost the battle. When Christians accepted no-fault divorce as being perfectly okay. Here's what no-fault divorce is from a legal standpoint. Okay, No-fault divorce is simply where I'm um, Chris and the New since we're married. And so I get up tomorrow and say, I don't want to marry you anymore. And I go to the courthouse and I file for divorce. I don't have to give a reason other than irreconcilable differences. Well, I don't know any couple that doesn't have irreconcilable differences over something. Okay, you're not always going to agree over everything. But that means you don't have to have a reason like adultery or you know, some other kind of you know, fraud or something like that. So when we, you know, the, the government began to legalize that in the 60s, when we said, that's okay, we'll let people who have been divorced for any other reason be treated just like everybody else. I'm not saying you have to create a class of a second class of people, but I'm saying we lost the moral high ground. Because here's what somebody can say, and what people do say. You Christians pick and choose what issues you want to argue over. The Bible has more to say on divorce than it does on homosexual relationships. Which is true. Which is true. And that's that. Whose Bible verses outweigh the others kind of thing. So, so I need to point to the higher 
standard for all relationships that God puts forward. And here's what that standard is. Okay? Hear this very clearly. The only, the only sexual relationship that God ordains is of a husband and a wife in a marriage for life. That is the only sexual relationship that God ordains. Anything outside of that is not what God desires. I want you to hear that because that is such a critical point that we fail to address. I read not long ago that for the first time in the history of the United States, you have more people cohabitating than married. You know what we used to call cohabitation? Shacking up. You know? So, so, so the point is, is that, that, that that's a sexual relationship outside of what God has ordained. And therefore, it's not something that God desires. So, we need to understand that. We need to point to that. Um, this is what Jesus says in Mark 10. He says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God is joined together, let not man separate. All... Sexual sin is sin. And, and, and we've got to be honest about that. And we live in a world that so easily brushes aside the fact that there is a massive problem in our culture with sexual sin. A massive problem. To the point that we don't even pay attention to it much anymore. But Jesus took this very seriously. And he talked about the danger even of lust. I mean, we live in a world where lust is so normal that people don't even think about it anymore. They just embrace it as a normal human experience. And Jesus said in Matthew 5 that anyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And this is his solution to lust. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. I think there should be more one-eyed people in this world, right? Okay. Um, it says it's better that you lose one of your members, one part of your body, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So the point that Jesus is saying is we have to take sin seriously. Take it seriously. All sin. All sin has to be taken seriously. And as a result, here's something that we Christians are really bad at. Okay? We also need to be willing to celebrate the godly gift of singleness and celibacy. Instead of degrading people who are unmarried as somehow less than people who are married. Okay? Um, there are some people in this world that God did not intend for them to marry, and they are perfectly fine with that, and they can live a fulfilled life without needing to be married. There's other people that if they didn't have their spouse, their world would be completely upside down, and they need their husband or their wife in their life. And we should celebrate both of those and not consider one less than the other. Okay? And celibacy. You know, anything outside of a marriage relationship, celebrate celibacy. Okay? Okay? So, first thing, point to God's higher sound. I promise I'm going to try to get done in the early morning. Secondly, understand that homosexual behavior is a sin, just like every other sin. This is where we have to really be very careful that we understand what we're talking about. And, you can, and I've got books on this, and I've read stuff, and it can get very complicated, so I'm going to try to be as concise as I can on this. All right. 
every human being has a sexual orientation. Okay? Every human being does. Heterosexual, homosexual, asexual. Okay? That's an orientation. Okay? They either are attracted to people of the opposite sex, of the same sex, or they're not attracted to people at all. Okay? That's part of human existence. We cannot argue from a position of authority that well, let me back up a second. One of the arguments I heard a lot growing up on this issue was um, you know, people are just born that way. So you, know, you can't, can't argue with the way somebody was born. Well, I was born straight. But there's guidelines for how I'm supposed to operate within the orientation that I have. Okay? Those guidelines exist. Your orientation does not mean you have to act a certain way. It just means you're oriented that way. Within the parameters of what God has said in His Word is the only appropriate relationship with which to operate. So someone who is attracted to someone of the same sex, that doesn't mean that they have to live that lifestyle. Okay? And it also doesn't mean that we can make them straight. It just means that the way that they live in a fallen world where sin is present is that they either have to live within the confines of what God has ordained or they live single and celibate. Okay? Homosexual behavior is just like any other sin. And we cannot forget that. All sin is offensive to God. We do not need to treat other sins as worse than other sins just because we're not guilty of it. Or as I heard someone say, don't degrade someone who sins differently than you do. Because okay. we all sin. A sin's a sin. Okay. It's all offensive to God. God dislikes it. We need to pursue holiness in our lives. And as a result, to live with an understanding of God's grace. That 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 passage that I read earlier, there's a verse that comes right after. Probably my favorite verse in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. After Paul lists this, this list of all these different sins, he says, And such were some of you. Such were. Past tense. Some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Understand this. Grace means that change is possible. Here's what the gospel calls us to do. The gospel does not call us to be perfect. It does not mean that we do not struggle. It just means that we recognize sin for what it is, and we repent of it, and we pursue holiness, and we seek God's grace to resist temptation. So, so I've got you know I've got friends of mine that have struggled with the same sex attraction for most of their you know, life that they can remember, and they choose not to to act on that. They choose to be celibate. They choose to live a life of godly singleness, and. But that doesn't mean they don't struggle. It doesn't mean that they don't, you know, they don't have thoughts that they you know, wouldn't want to normally have. It doesn't mean that they don't want something different in their life. It's just grace is there so that when they do sin, they repent of it. It also doesn't mean they have a license to go out and do whatever they want to and say, God will forgive me. It means they live a life of obedience. I want to very quickly address some of the common criticisms that you'll hear from people who support full LGBT inclusion. Um, and, and that, you know, LGBT has been the common parlance for sometimes actually becoming passe. Um, now it's LGBTQA. Um, you know, so, you know, all 26 letters of the alphabet name with the number four over. Who knows? All right. Um, but, but here's the probably the most common thing you'll hear from someone who 
is engaged in that lifestyle. And, and here's, here's the problem that I have encountered when I talk to people who are practicing homosexuals, practicing um, that lifestyle, is it's not just what they do in a sexual sense, it's their identity. They find their identity in their sexual identity, <coughs> as opposed to finding their identity in Christ. Okay? That, I think, is why this is such a struggle for churches, because we don't understand that. We don't understand the sense of community that often comes with the gay and lesbian community. Uh, I mean, it's a family. It really is to a, lot, a large degree. And so, uh, let me recommend a couple books to you. If you know people that are struggling with this issue, or you want some more clarity on it, two good, really good books. Uh, the first one's a really short one. It's by a man by the name of Sam Alberry. A-L-L-B-E-R-R-Y. The title of it is just, Is God Anti-Gay? Okay, it's maybe 60, 70 pages long. It's a short little book. Okay. Good, good, good stuff. And he's writing from a personal vantage point. Another really good book, if you're interested in a good story, is a book by the name of The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert by Rosario Butterfield. Okay? Rosario, R-O-S-A-R-I-O, Butterfield, just like it sounds. Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Rosario Butterfield's story is probably one of the most amazing stories of anybody I've ever read. She was an English professor at a uh, world-renowned university in New York. I believe she was at Syracuse. Um, she was in a lesbian relationship. She had a lesbian partner. She lived across the street from a retired Presbyterian pastor and his wife. And they started inviting them over for dinner. They would invite Rosario and her um, lesbian partner over to their house for dinner, not knowing that he was a former pastor. And they get into some conversation. They begin, and over a long period of conversation, and explain the gospel. Rosario understands that she's a sinner and she's in need of salvation, so she becomes a Christian. Understand the call of the gospel. She breaks off the relationship with her partner, loses her teaching position. Over this. Okay. Loses her identity and everybody that she thought was her friend basically abandons her. <coughs> but in her story, Christ is worth it. Wonderful story. Um, from a practice, she got a new book out. I haven't read all of them, read parts of it. It's called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. It's her take on hospitality and how important it is to be hospitable to people who are struggling. Because you can invite people to church they won't show up, but they'll come over for them. And they'll sit across the table from you. And uh, it's a good way to engage conversation. So those are two good books I'd recommend as others. Um, there's a really, it's just an interesting story. And I never can remember the guy's name, but the name of it is Messy Grace. And it's his story of, he, um, it's kind of the reverse of what you tend to see happen. He was raised in a uh, openly gay home and like grew up going to gay pride events and all this kind of stuff, and he becomes a Christian. And his question's like, how do I deal with my parents? <laughs> it's kind of the reverse of what you typically see. So it's a, it's a really, I never can remember the guy's name correct. Anyway, um, so here's the common criticisms that you hear. Don't judge. Who are you judge me? And the most misquoted you Bible verse is Matthew 7 1. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Context is everything, remember? He says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the measure you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the law that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is still a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Here's the country version, country paraphrase of what Jesus just said. Sweep around your own front door before you go sweeping around somebody else's. Okay? That's all he's saying there. He's not saying you cannot help, you cannot help people who are in the wrong. 
He's encouraging it. He's just saying, make sure you've got it worked out in your own life before you go help somebody else with their problem, because then they'll think you're a hypocrite. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I've always thought it was funny when you, when you have a, a really overweight doctor tell you to go on diet. It's kind of hard, or a really skinny chef, kind of goes both hand in hand. Okay? You know, it's a certain thing just seem hypocritical. And um, so you got to do that. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for somebody is to just be honest. That's the most loving thing you can do. It's not easy. Sometimes it's really hard. What's the best thing you can do is just be honest with them. Okay, that's what love calls us to do. Secondly, Christians simply pick and choose what they want to believe. That kind of goes back to the whole who's got more Bible verses on their side. We have to see the picture, the big picture of the whole of God's story as the redemptive relationship of God with people who were sinners. And everybody's a sinner. And, and here's something that, that I have to remind myself of <clears throat> that is quite helpful for me. <clears throat> you know, until I die, there will still be sins in my life that God is working on me with. That's just a common truth. Um, I, I remember talking to a lady who had just turned 100, and she said she must have been a really bad sinner for God to leave her around for so long to have to keep working on all these issues. So, um, but, but the point being is that we all have areas, and sometimes there are blind spots in our life, and we don't see them right away. And God shows them to us through His Word or through other people, and then we repent of it and we work through it by God's grace. This issue is one that will be a defining issue for Christians for the next generation. It already is becoming a major dividing point in churches. As a result of this, we have to be very humble to understand that there are going to be people who love Jesus who maybe aren't where we are on these issues. Okay? That doesn't mean that God can't enlighten them. Just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're not a Christian. Now, the opposite of that is, if somebody is blatantly aware of what God says and is refusing to deal with it, then that's a hard issue and shows that they're not really repentant. So, ignorance is one thing. Blatant disobedience is something else. So we have to understand that it's not just that we pick and choose, it's that, that we all have blind spots in our life. And they're all issues that we struggle with. Okay? So, I understand that third criticism that you often hear is Jesus never addresses this issue. Well, there's lots of things Jesus doesn't talk about. But the Bible talks about a lot of things that Jesus himself doesn't speak to. And when the Bible speaks, God's speaking. So, so just because it's not written in red doesn't mean it's not true. But Jesus does talk an awful lot about sexual immorality. So, so to say he doesn't address this issue, therefore it's a non-issue, is really missing the point entirely of what, um, of what the Bible's about. And then a fourth one that I hear people say is that God would never intend for someone to be different than who they are. You know, God made me this way. God wants me to be happy. God wants me to find love in my life. God would never intend for me to be anything other than who I am. Uh, one of the worst phrases that the world uses now, and it drives me crazy when I hear it, is you be you. Okay? You be you. I, I, I just, I, I irk every time I hear somebody say that. Because that is the complete antithesis of the gospel. You know what the problem with the world is? Us. I'm the problem. You're the problem. Every other human being is the problem with the world. Us being us is what's got us in the mess we're in. We've got to stop being us. And so to say God would never intend you to be someone different than who you are, that's the point of the gospel, that God wants you to be different than who you are, and that the gospel calls us to give our entire self, body, soul, mind, strength, heart, every part of who we are, completely 
surrendered to him. And to not say, well, I believe, but I'm going to do what I want to do. That is not the gospel. Jesus himself said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, let him not be who he is. Take up his cross daily and follow him. The gospel requires that we surrender our entire self, every aspect of our lives, anything that's displeasing to God, that we give it all to Him and be the people that He wants us to be. Because he made us. He knows what's best. Is it easy? No. <coughs> Is it always pleasant? No. But it's always worth it. That's where we as Christians need to fall on this issue. You know, not standing with signs, protesting, saying, you know, God hates gay people. God hates sin. He hates sin so much that Jesus went to the cross for it. Sin is sin. Sin is something that we need to be serious about because God is serious about it. Now, there's not a special class of sinners called gay people. There's only two kinds of people in this world. There's sinners, and there's sinners who know Jesus. That's it. Okay? So hopefully that helps us going forward on this issue. Well, are there big sins and little sins? Uh, well, I'll put it to you this way. There is sin, which is the attitude of our hearts toward God. That is all evil. Sin is sin is sin. There are sins, individual sins, that fall under that, that do carry different weight. Because idolatry is far worse than cussing. Okay? Um, you know, so, so there are differences of weight in that regard. So in that respect, here's what I tell people. You know, Jesus says, you know, going back to the Matthew passage there, if anyone looks at a woman with lustful intent and he's committed adultery with her, that's hard. Which is worse, looking at a woman with lustful intent or actually committing adultery? Actually committing adultery is far worse. So yes, there are degrees of, of seriousness. Okay, which is worse, thinking about killing somebody? Or actually killing somebody. Both are the result of that bigger sin problem that is sin, singular, that is our attitude of our hearts toward God. Well, <coughs> the two examples that you gave. Mm -hmm. The first one is the sin within yourself, but the sin that you actually commit affects other people and it causes them heartache. Right. And I think the Bible makes it very clear that, that there are. You know, there's a sin within us that we have to deal with, and then there's sins that when we affect other people, there's restitution, there's you know, forgiveness that we have to seek with other people. So I, I, mean, I think the Bible makes that distinction. Maybe not as clear as we would like at times. James says, you know, when you've spelled in one way, you're guilty of it all. Well, that doesn't mean that, you know, just because I, I said a dirty word, I can go out and kill somebody, and it's the same. Okay, that, that would be a misunderstanding of that, so... Any other questions? Do you have a problem with the, I, it's something that I've heard many times um, that you can love the person but not love their lifestyle or not love what they do? Uh, hate the sin, not hate the sinner. We do it to ourselves all the time. We love ourselves but we hate some of the stuff that we do. We do the same thing. The problem I have with the way that approach is taken so often is um, it becomes a way to condone. And that's why, and there's a lot more to this issue than we can get into tonight related to the issue of how identity is determined. Um, if you find your sense of identity and self-worth and, and connectedness, all of that is tied up into your sexual identity, then, then to say you disagree with that person's lifestyle, lifestyle they see that as much more than saying, I don't like the fact that you're a Clemson fan 
or Carolina fan or whatever, you know. Um, that's a lifestyle choice in that respect. And so you can love that person. I love a lot of football fans, even though they get crazy this time of year. Okay. Um, so you know, the point being is that you know, we, we have to understand what we're meaning when we actually say that. But yeah, I mean, we, we do that to ourselves. We, we, we hate the stuff that we do, but we love ourselves. And that's why we can't, we don't need to be angry at people who sin differently than we do. Um, understand we're all sinners. Uh, I know a lot of practical pastoral issues that come up with this. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, and, and I know we, we're at time, so I didn't get done earlier. I'm sorry. But uh, I'll tell you this story real quick. I was talking to a friend of mine about a year ago, and uh, you know, pastor of a church about the size of ours, they had a, a lady that um, started coming to the church and attended very faithfully, and, and she approached him about wanting to join the church, and so he said, well, let's have a conversation. Well, come to find out, she had been born a he. And she was married to a man. There's lots of complications with that from a pastoral perspective. <laughs> I mean, you know, does, you know, you know, it is an issue of gender and, and all this kind of stuff that the world's dealing with and so confused on and so going haywire on issues of marriage and what's permissible and what's allowable and then you get the issues of divorce. I mean, it was, it was it's a mess. And um, he, he kind of just threw his hands up and said, you know, y'all can attend but you can't join because we don't, we're not equipped to address this issue at this moment. So, um, and, and, and he, she, whatever pronoun you want to use was okay with that in the moment. So, but it, you know, it's a very complicated issue, and, those, and, and don't think that we won't address those issues in this church as, as the future progresses. The world is, I mean, this, this is something that's prevalent in Denmark and Bamberg County, and it will at some point, it will rear its head in the life of our church because the world is the world. And we have to approach it with an understanding of God's grace and that we are imperfect, but also that God calls us to live a holy life and we can't condone sin. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's so complicated. So complicated. <clears throat> Pray for your Methodist friends right now. They're really struggling over this whole issue in the Methodist church right now. Um, in fact, the United Methodist Church is probably going to split in the next year or so over this very issue. So. Well, I have a niece that's, um, uh, she's a senior in college this year, and uh, she, she goes to, she's from a broken home, mm -hmm. and she goes to the Lutheran Church with her grandparents on one side. And, uh, um, and of course, when she's with the other side, then she goes to the Baptist church. Well, the Lutheran preacher has married two men. And she says, I don't, I can't find myself going and sitting in the, in the sermon and getting what I feel like I should be getting from his sermon, knowing that he's going against the instructions of the Bible. But yet she doesn't want to hurt her grandparents. <coughs> By telling them that they can't, she can't go to church, or she doesn't feel like she needs to be going there. Right, let me just give you a verse to close on tonight. It's going back to Romans chapter one, because this is you know the idea of of guilt by association to a degree. The last verse of Romans chapter one, uh, verse thirty-two: Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, Paul's talking about idolatry and sin, you know not just homosexuality, but sin in general, they deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So here's what Paul's saying in that, in that verse, is that there is a consequence. You may not be guilty of that sin, 
But to know something is a sin and to allow it and to condone it and to bless it is just as guilty as doing it yourself in that context. Guilty by association. Guilty by association. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that runs into the issue of, you know, do you attend the wedding of someone that you don't agree with the person they're marrying? And that's not just the same sex issue. I mean, that's across the board. And I would argue that from a area of conscience and conviction, probably best not to. Uh, but that's something that everybody has to kind of figure out for themselves on that. And it's, it's complicated. It's not an easy answer. Okay? So... All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that we would know what you would want us to do. And I thank you for that. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding of your will. But Lord, let us be people who believe and practice grace, knowing that by your grace,